Okay, so Martin and I, we've walked quite a way out uh, to the north, most northern part of right. Leafton Asylum. Yep. So we're standing at this um, down the building now. Could you just kind of just where we are now, Russell? Is we're at the very, very heart of the 42 acres they used to harvest to feed the 200, 2,400 people that were were here uh, when it opened in the 1870s. What's behind us is the old farmer's cottage. Mr. Buchanan was the first farmer here, and he was paid 25 shillings a week plus the use of this two-bedroom uh, house um, to harvest uh, 42 acres uh, to supply vegetables. Uh, and fruit to the uh, to the hospital. He also worked with about 64 patients, so they would help him harvest all this and everything. Um, so this was his very first house. And then as we move on down the pathway, we'll start to get to different areas, uh, the actual 42 acres, the uh, eight acres that they used to graze the cattle that fed uh, milk to all the hospital, um, and the sewage treatment plant, and then on to the mysterious uh, uh, cemetery where we might have a mass burial. Right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Where we are right now is we're on the very, very north side of the park. This is where they had the cemetery. Now, back in the days in 1870, when they opened the first cemetery, it would have been right across the road here, and it would have been right next to what is what you can see as the caretaker's lodge or the grave digger's lodge. Um, now, they only had they only had that uh, that grave site in 1870. They only had that for about 16 years, and then they mysteriously asked for another well, 1,192 square yards so they could have another cemetery. Well, we come to find out during our investigations and everything, there was a bit of a problem with the watering system. What they ended up doing was accidentally poisoning themselves with cholera. So they pumped poisoned water up to the up to the hospital, causing a cholera epidemic, and they actually needed to find a new place to put a mass grave because they had so many people that had passed away from this. This was about 1898. So we have the records over in Hertfordshire um, Historical Society. We have the records there. In 1905, the Diocese of St. Albans uh, authorized the move of the cemetery and consecrated the ground that's right behind us. So this lich gate right here, although it says 1886, was actually across the road at the very second uh, cemetery. Yeah. Um, so that was there in 1886. Then they moved it across the road in 1905 when they opened up this cemetery. So it's very interesting that they would have had to have only had a cemetery for about six years and then suddenly move across the street. So let's go take a look inside this cemetery here. Sure. Okay, Martin, now, uh, now I'm coming to the conclusion of our visit. Yeah. Uh, this is a quite a significant place. Uh, could you could you explain to me? I mean, it, it, it looks like it's overgrown, but this yeah. has a significant. Uh, it is. It has a very significant uh, uh, place as far as the whole hospital goes because it was the third uh, cemetery that they did have here on site, and it was uh, uh, consecrated in 1905. And this is where. If you were a, a, a staff member in good standing here at the hospital, you had a free place um, for burial, you know, after you've done your 35 years and everything, um, and you were buried alongside the road, um, you can see the three stations, or four stations of the cross, uh, you know, up here. Uh, so it's your typical cemetery setup. Um, we have a, a memorial stone that was laid here when they opened the cemetery in 1905, and it, it says basically, remember uh, uh, to God uh, um, all those who were buried here, uh, and whose names are recorded in the Book of Remembrance at Leavesden Hospital Chapel. Unfortunately, we've never been able to find that original um, Book of Remembrance. We're still looking for it. Um, there's a lot of people who have relatives that are here, and we're trying to. We're working now on trying to get all the names collected and everything, uh, so we have a record of it. Um, it is overgrown, it isn't properly being taken care of, you know, we are trying to do some things with it. Getting the local district council to take responsibility for this area and just not let it uh, go to waste um, because it is a very memorable place. We still have people that, uh, that contact us from all over the world with relatives that may be here. They're, they're doing, a, you know, a genealogy research and they want to know if their great-grandmother is here or not. So we're trying to help with that and so we're going to be working to um, put some names together and, and really, you know, try and, try and find out who's here. and and make a record of their, 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 their last resting place. So yes. it's going to be quite an adventure. Okay. This would have been the cemetery for both staff and patients. The only right. thing is, is oh, yeah. if, you, if you were staff and you had enough money, relatives had enough money to buy you a headstone or whatever, you'd be closer to the main road here. If it was a pauper grave, um, you would have been farther away, so you would have been back there towards the edges and everything where you see a lot of the open uh, grave sites that have collapsed over time because back in the days of the 1870s, 1860s, it was very common to bury people eight deep, especially if it was a pauper's grave. 
Um, so that's what they did around here. That's why we unfortunately have a lot of the collapsing graves and everything, and no record of actually who's there because they couldn't afford headstones and everything. So that's why we're trying to look for some paper records, um, either through the current NHS record system or with private uh, collectors and everything. So, um, so yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do. So we know that Aaron Kosminski was taken uh, yes. by his brother Wolf to yep. East Ham Cemetery. Where we're standing here, um, is, you're telling me that this is um, the staff graveyard, right. but also the inmates, or I would say patients, yep. uh, or even residents, or even service users graveyard. Yep. Um, we can see here a, a wooden headstone. Right, uh, so this, this would be Eliza Week. She's um, one of the noted ones. Now, this is a wooden headstone that we had. Now, Eliza worked for the hospital over 30 years. She passed away in 1917 at the age of 62. So she would have had an honored, honored place here for having so much service with the hospital, um, as everybody did. Um, so this is just an example of how they used to take care of everybody if you did long service. You got the gold watch, you know, and a free place to be buried, so. Thank you. Now also, uh, as I've noticed, we've walked around, we can see that um, certain pockets, uh, so our dates are all around the same time. So if Aaron Kosminski wasn't taken from, uh, his body wasn't taken, right from Leafston Asylum by his brother Wolf. Um, he may have been buried in this section, you say? That's right. If, if Aaron Kosminski was actually left here and he had not been taken away, um, because of the way they would have organized everybody in the same times, you know, passing away in the same years or close to or whatever, it's a good likelihood that Aaron Kosminski would have buried, been buried right over in the northwest corner over there in the pauper section. In the pauper section. So the one thing I'd like to ask you is about the cholera epidemic right. um, and could you explain to me about the where they buried the bodies then? Right, what happened was is we had a rumor there was a, there was a, a history, a story being told of a mass grave somewhere and as I started doing some research about two years ago I was in the archives up in Orpheter County and the uh, first cemetery that we had was actually across the street from this one um, and that was the first one they had in 1870. Um, then only about 16 years later they, they requested an additional 1,192 square yards of cemetery space from the farm. Well that's kind of odd because you wouldn't have filled up a cemetery in 17 years just with the normal rate, you know, especially if they were burying everybody eight deep. You would have had a lot of room for many years. Yeah. Um, so what we found out during the records was is also during that time they requested money for the investigation of the water system. They also wanted to investigate a fever outbreak. Now if you put that all together, they requested more space they didn't really fill the space that they had in the, in the first you know, instance, when they first opened the hospital. They were investigating the water, and they were investigating a fever outbreak. Then all of a sudden, they have, six years later, they move all the way from that, and now they're across the reed where we are here in 1905 in the new cemetery. So if you put that all together, that's a pretty good uh, explanation for where the mass grave might be. We don't know how many people are there, we don't know how many people really died, but it is the one area in all of the park, in all of this, this site now, that is restricted uh, as far as access to. No one's allowed to go in there, you're not allowed to develop it, you're not allowed to sell it, you can't do anything with that land. So there's restrictions on the land, um, you know, the time frame just shows that something happened and uh, they had to move away from that quite quick. So I think that pretty much solves the mystery of where the mass grave is. Mr. Martin, thank you ever so My much pleasure. for your time. Thank you. Thanks.